I just had built this completely the wrong way. And I was making that mistake that a lot of entrepreneurs make actually. And there'll be people listening to this that are making this mistake right now. So if you are, please heed this warning, right? You can't be all things to all people. You can't wear every hat in your business. It's not possible. And so many people say things like, well, I know that, but I can't afford to hire someone right now. So I'll just do this until I can afford to hire someone. Well, do a trade. People are saying, I've got this great business idea. I just need 10 grand capital to be able to get to where I need to be. And when you break it down, they don't need that at all. They need physical things. They need items. They need yeah. services. And you can do a trade for those services. Welcome to Millionaire Secrets, the podcast where we dive deep into the minds of millionaires and entrepreneurs living their version of success. So you can get there too. This podcast was born from my own personal obsession with learning from successful people, and I have traveled the world in order to put myself in a room with the best of the best, millionaire and billionaire entrepreneurs, celebrities with massive influence, and icons who are changing the world with their message. My name is Bethan Jepson. I'm an award-winning entrepreneur, and I'm on an absolute mission to make wealth, success, influence, and change accessible to everyone who is willing to do what it takes to earn it. Get ready for some amazing interviews where we reveal some epic and unheard of millionaire business and lifestyle secrets. I'm on a personal journey of seeking my own version of business success, but without sacrificing my happiness. If you believe in the success without sacrifice ethos too, then I invite you to join the free Success Circle Network community where we collaborate, problem solve and support each other. You can get all the information via my website at bethanjepson.com. I'm still absolutely buzzing about being back for season two of the podcast. And our next guest is an absolute legend. Phil Paluccia is the founder of Billionaires in Boxes, a TV host and producer ranked as the number one podcast publicist for businesses, clocking over 10,000 hours and 13 years of podcasting, reaching an audience of over half a million listeners and over 1 million viewers. Phil helps business leaders unlock the power of game-changing strategic alliances by leveraging podcasting and media. So basically combining my two favorite things, networking and podcasting. And that's not all we have in common. Aside from living down the road from each other and sharing the same name as my dad, <laughs> as the name of Phil's business, Billionaires in Boxes, suggests, he believes in building businesses in a way that aligns with your optimum lifestyle. And as you'll hear on the podcast, he has some pretty unique ways of doing so. Phil and I have stayed in touch since we recorded this, and he is genuinely a lovely, inspiring, wonderful addition to my network. So it gives me great pleasure to share his message with you all. And you can also connect with Phil via LinkedIn or his website, billionairesinboxes.com. Both Phil and I would love to hear your takeaways from this episode. So please share these on the social platform of your choice, tagging us in. For now, please enjoy this episode. Okay, wonderful. Welcome to Millionaire Secrets, Phil Paluccia. It's great to have you here. Thanks for having me. It's going to be a lot of fun. It is. <laughs> Don't know what you're in for yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my listeners will know we always start with. Um, well, I actually they're not really that rapid fire. Um, I always advertise them as rapid fire questions, but <laughs> actually people tend to kind of take their own liberties with that. So there's actually sure. no pressure to answer them super fast. But yeah, anyway. <laughs> Okay, cool. The name of them, really, but anyway. Give me the rapid fire, non rapid response <laughs> questions. <laughs> uh, okay, so first question, which should be fairly rapid, actually, is where do you live? Uh, just outside Liverpool in the UK at the moment. Oh, at the moment, okay. I'm not supposed to be here. That's kind of why it's at the moment. <laughs> uh, okay, interesting. Uh, where are you supposed to be? Just out of interest? Okay. Cape Town, South Africa, recording season two of our TV series and still can't get down there to record because of COVID. Yeah, that's a bummer. Yeah, man. And where did you grow up? Chester. What was your first job and what did it teach you? Uh, I was a farmhand um, working the land and it taught me taught me two things it taught me that it was 
far more profitable to delegate stuff to other people and get them to do it rather than me do it. And it taught me that eating strawberries whilst picking them and falling asleep in a strawberry field is not a good idea. <laughs> what are the consequences of that then? <laughs> uh, horrific sunburn, docked wages for the day and losing your job. <laughs> <laughs> well there you go lesson learned <laughs> absolutely i won't do that again <laughs> um did you have a role model or a mentor that inspired you to start your first business and if so who was that yeah i probably had a couple actually um so the first one the very first one was he it was my best friend's dad now i'm sure we'll get into this a little bit as we go through but i didn't come from money i came from a, a single parent family on benefits and my best friend was the complete opposite he had the loving mum and dad relationship and they were absolutely wadded or at least as as was a kid they were wadded you know as far as i was concerned and um his dad was in real estate and he used to buy out old public houses regenerate them and then sell them on to different breweries and i just used to love the fact that like we'd always go out for a pub lunch with them and he'd be like i own that one i own that one we did this one and i just used to find that fascinating so he was probably the first inspiration for me in terms of looking at that going that he can provide so well for his family and he just gets to do some really cool stuff so i think he was the first person i ever looked at and was like yeah i want to do that i want to own my own business amazing so you literally had like a rich dad poor dad kind of yeah very much so yeah <laughs> except he wasn't my dad yeah but um i mean i hope maybe i don't know maybe at some point but no um he if i know i really didn't have that exact scenario because my dad was useless and my stepdad who but we met in later life he was also useless so i just had poor dad poor dad <laughs> um but yeah he was the like i grew up with him from a very young age i mean my my best friend and i at the time we we went through um nursery school together primary school together secondary school together and we stayed friends until our early 20s when I mean, we're still fr friends now as far as facebook friends and stuff are concerned but in our mid-20s we kind of went off to different sides of the planet and weren't as in touch as before but i think we probably spent five or six days a week with each other from the age of four to the age of about 20. Mm. Oh, amazing um i say that because I'm, I'm friends with all like my childhood friends like basically my only friends <laughs> yeah if they're a good bunch you can trust them right because they've yeah, been there exactly. through everything so yeah exactly so i really um yeah i resonate with that um what was your biggest lesson from the pandemic there was a positive and there was well, in fact there were both positives but there was a positive and then there was a one that was kind of a painful lesson to learn but it ended up being a positive so um, the first one was when I when I, cause I actually fell sick. I think I remember telling you I actually fell sick quite early on. Um, I was at the Liverpool game against Atletico Madrid uh, when Madrid had been into lockdown like four days prior and they let like 6,000 fans travel over to Liverpool. <laughs> and I ended up catching COVID. And uh, the actual initial virus wasn't all that bad for me, but I developed long COVID. So I had like severe chronic fatigue. I had pneumonia for like six months. So I was in a bit of a weird place. And as somebody who is a, you know, a self-confessed workaholic, um, I was now kind of in a position that I could only work kind of a few hours a day. So the first lesson that came from that was um, – I asked all of my customers, I was like, look, if I've only got two or three hours a day to spend on my work, so I can't do everything that I would normally do, what do you find the most valuable of, of what I do? And they all gave me the same answers, which really kind of helped me to reshape the business because I was like, well, why am I spending 80% of my, of my time doing this stuff? And they don't even like me doing this stuff. They, they just prefer me to focus on this 20%. So I did that. Um, and that actually ended up resulting in me working four day weeks which i will never change i love working four day weeks um, i work monday tuesdays thursday fridays every week and wednesdays and the weekends are mine um don't do anything on those days at all so that was a juicy one the other one was i was amazed at um there are some people in my team that really really stepped up really really stepped up and there were other people that surprised me at how much they let me down mm. um and 
you know, as anybody in business will tell you, you know, you, you like celebrating the successes, but having to let people go is, is never a fun part of what you do. And there were sort of two or three people that were relatively, I'm not going to say senior, but they were certainly important within my business that I parted ways with um, since the pandemic because of their lack of stepping up. Uh, meanwhile, other people kind of stepped into their shoes and gained promotion off the back of it because they really did kind of step up. They they owned it and they ran with it and were much better as a business because of it. But I think it's, uh, you know, the pandemic for a lot of people, I think it, it would put a magnifying glass and a spotlight on the cracks and the good parts of their business. And once you've seen it, you can't really unsee it. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's so true. Um, that's what I think that answer is like just such a big lesson like if people stopped listening after this answer I think they'd still get a lot of value from that because I think it's so true like we can spend so much time doing stuff that doesn't matter and like yeah it's like how often do you ask your customers that question like how much are you assuming how much are you yeah yeah. So, yeah. It was amazing. So, we, I mean, literally, I, I mean, I'll give you the answer. For for me, it was, um, you know, I spoke to people and they're like, well, we really like you when you do this, this and this. But in all, in all honesty, we get the most value out of the strategy sessions and even out of the videos that you do. Because what I typically do is if there's a lesson that I think, OK, there's something that I need to kind of share across everybody because it's a. I've just had this discussion. It's an insight that's just come up with somebody. I want to share it. I'll do an audio recording or a video to say, look, we've just been having this conversation. This has come up. I feel like it'd be really relevant for all of you. Here it is. And people are like, yeah, it's the strategy stuff. It's like the videos and the one-on-ones. Like that's where we get most of our time. And I kind of looked at it and was like, that's only about 20% of my time. Like the rest of my time is busy doing all of this other stuff. Um, And actually we were able to put some of those services down completely. We stopped doing certain things. Um, I was able to delegate loads of the other stuff, but that meant that that 20% of my time now became 100% of my time and the business has never been more successful because of it. Mm. Ah, Good stuff, good stuff. What's um, What's your next big goal? (laughs) <laughs> uh, so billionaires in boxes will become the world's most recognized business broadcast network i'm already working towards it so we work about we do about 250 hours worth of business television content per month at the moment um and that's across 15 different satellite television networks but at some point over the next handful of years um uh, not long actually minimum you know maximum five years minimum two i would imagine and we're actually going to take that content back off those networks and start our own channel, which will later become our own network. Yeah. Um, and it's all, it's all about, I mean, it's kind of split down the middle, right? So it's about 50-50. So 50% of it is showcasing the high potential growth organizations and the businesses from the emerging markets that we work with. These are going to be the businesses and entrepreneurs of tomorrow that people need to know about. Um, and the other 50% is going to be working with the high performance individuals that we do across, you know, the, the investment communities and the public companies that we work with that, you know, if you were to buy mentorship or training from them would cost you hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars a year, but actually doing it one to many via a, a TV network, a TV series means that we can empower a ton of people um, through that content. And hopefully, you know, I describe it as introducing the emerging markets to the rest of the world and the rest of the world to the emerging markets. That's, that's how I describe it. Amazing. Amazing. Oh, next question. Juicy one. What's the bravest thing you've ever done? Hmm. What's the bravest thing I've ever done? Um, there's two that come to mind and neither of them are business related actually. Um, so one of them was, was probably more stupid than it was brave. Um, (laughs) somebody was uh, walking their dog and their dog fell under the railings of uh, a key, like a, a shipping key. And they tried to try and reach in to grab them and they fell in and started to drown. Oh my God. And uh, people were getting the big sort of hoop and throwing it in and they were calling the police and all this kind of stuff to try and help them. And me having like a, a superhero complex decided that I was just going to dive in. Um, but anybody who's ever tried to swim in a key with a jacket and jeans on <laughs> will tell you that I was essentially just like a giant anchor trying to, <laughs> trying to help this person. And actually parts, I thought I was kind of dragging them into the water. Um, <laughs> So, uh, but I, I managed to get the ring and, and get them and they kind of hauled us both up the side and, and they were, thankfully they were okay. And I, I got a, like a, 
I got a city bravery award for that, which wow. was quite funny because everybody who didn't know me was telling me how brave that was. Everybody who knew me was telling me how stupid that was. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's probably one. The other one is uh, up until a few years ago, I was absolutely petrified of heights. I mean, I'm still not particularly good with heights. It's not so much the heights I have a problem with. It's falling from that height and dying, I think, mm. is probably my my fear. Um, and I decided that one day I was going to, I was going to face it head on just like I do everything in my life. And the best way to deal with this is to, you know, the best way to make sure you're not scared of the monster under the bed is to look and see if there's a monster under the bed. Right. So I uh, did the bungee jump off the Soweto cooling towers in Johannesburg. Holy moly. And um, I did about two seconds into the jump and would have instantly gone back up and done it again. It was the most fun thing I've ever done in my life. Uh, and I've actually become a bit of a, a bungee fanatic since then. And I actually, whenever we go away, I plan kind of where's the biggest bungee in this place? Like, how can I do this one? So wow. yeah, I became a bit of an adrenaline junkie off it, but that was pretty brave. I mean, I was, uh, I often say to people, the lift up the side of the cooling tower kind of goes at such a weird angle to get up there. If that hadn't have been such a terrifying experience, I probably wouldn't have done the bungee mm -hmm. because I was sat up there going, I don't want to do this. I'm going to go back down. But the prospect of getting back in that lift scared me even more than just doing the jump. Um, so I said <laughs> to somebody like, I'm really scared. And I said, maybe I should go the lift. And he says, the lift takes two minutes. And he said, the jump will be over in 30 seconds. Like that's the quickest way of getting down. So I was like, Let's just do this. Uh, I uh, love that. It's such a metaphor for life, that isn't it? Like, <laughs> you, once you're up there, you're better off just jumping. You might as well just do it at this point. Yeah. And it was dead funny because I was desperate to. I had like a GoPro with me, and I was desperate to say something really cool on the jump down, right? <laughs> and because uh, everyone else was like shouting cool stuff, and some people were doing like a flip off it before they go down. And I was stood on the edge, and I was like, I tried looking down. The guy like lifted my chin up and was like, "Don't look down." Right, he goes, we're going to shout three, two, one, bungee, and you're going to go, right? He said, do you want me to push you? And I was like, no, I can do it. And he goes, okay. She goes, three, two, one. And then as I jump, I just go, bungee. <laughs> so, so, so I literally do the whole bungee, like with this GoPro in my face with me just screaming bungee as loud as I can. <laughs> Oh. so that was a lot of fun actually that was that was that was brave at the time but now i i if you if you said to me phil we're gonna go there this afternoon and do it again we, are you up for it the answer is 100 percent yes i'm well mm. up for that oh i just love that because it just really shows like fear it's not it doesn't represent real life it's it's your no. it's the thought of doing it than rather than yeah. actually doing it and that we just, always it's the same with business though right we make the we build it up to be something that is not in our mind and we're, the, the the worst case scenario that we often play through in our mind is never the scenario that actually happens yeah. <laughs> and we've just spent all of that unnecessary time torturing ourselves with the prospect that something might happen that hasn't or isn't going to yeah it's yeah it's uh yeah it just shows it's a it's a mind game <laughs> definitely <laughs> really is a, life is just a mind game um okay what are you finding difficult in your life or business right now? This is going to sound really arrogant. I'm not. I don't think there is anything at the moment. I'm really, I'm really happy. I mean, look, there's growth to be done, but like for the first time in a very long time, like I'm actually really content with, with what we're doing. Like I'm, I love my life. I love my family. I mean, I'm kind of frustrated we can't travel, but I guess everybody's got that. Um, but no, there's nothing I'm particularly finding challenging right now. I'm, uh, everything's kind of doing what it's supposed to be doing. We're growing the way that we're supposed to be growing. Um, smashing seven figures. If we keep going the way we're doing, we'll do eight figures in the next 12 months. And I'm, I'm loving life. I mean, I, I can't think of anything. I mean, there's always little things you'd improve, right? Like, I, I, if I could have a six pack, I'd have a six pack. Um, but it's not like I'm going, all right, I've got a challenge in my life. I've got to get to this point where I have a six pack. It's like, no, there's things that I would do and tweak and things that I would improve. But I think that's just, that will always be the case, right? But it's uh, for for one of the very first times in my life, it's no, my happiness is no longer dependent on once I get to this destination, I'll be happy. Um, I'm just enjoying the ride as well. So I don't think there is one. Mm. Oh, good for you. I love that answer. 
I mean, you're actually not the first person to say, oh, there is nothing. <laughs> so and I think it, I think it speaks to that mindset that you just described. Um, okay. What has been the best day in your business career so far? Best day in my business career so far. It's probably the first time I did a keynote speech in China um, for lots of reasons. It was a, uh, it was battling with imposter syndrome. It was at the time, it was the biggest stage I'd ever spoken on. So I was literally sandwiched in between, um, Samsung and Microsoft. Um, I was speaking on the same stage as Zuckerberg. Um, I was at the largest tech event in Asia, having been paid to paid to speak by them and paid to go by the British government to represent them. Um, and then the speech that we did that I was, I had a real attack of imposter syndrome before I walked out on stage because it was about six, six or 7,000 people in the audience. And they were, I, mean, I think it was about that. And they were all executive levels within technology, every single one of them. Right. Mm. And, you know, in this room is like the head of Chinese telecom, <laughs> you know, Microsoft are there, Apple are there, Samsung are there, like everybody's there. And I had this moment where it was like, Phil, you've got 10 minutes till you're on. And my brain went, you can't do this. (laughs) Right. And my head just started going, you're about to walk out in front of 6,000 people. And in less than two minutes, they're going to know that you haven't got a clue what you're talking about. And this is what my brain's doing to me just before I go and do the biggest talk of my life. So I was really, really nervous. And I get up on stage and I always like to do a bit of an icebreaker. So I always make a joke. When I first start, not a very good joke, but a bit of a bad <laughs> joke, just some some giggles, right? Um, and I kind of did the whole British sarcasm thing because this stage is massive. And I just said, um, I'm a bit disappointed. It's nice to be here, but I'm a bit disappointed with the size of the stage because <laughs> um, this thing's huge and nobody laughed. <laughs> so I was like, oh, no. And then I carried on talking and then they all started laughing. And I was like, I'm confused. <laughs> like, what's going on? And then I realized that the translator for most of the people in the room was about 20 to 30 seconds behind what I've just said. So they were laughing at the joke I just made 30 seconds ago, but it took me a good minute or two to figure out that that's what was going on. Cause I was like, well, that bit wasn't funny. <laughs> like, <laughs> why are we laughing at that bit? Um, but anyway, it led to hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of business that we won just from that one talk in that one room. Um, you know, the, I, I tell this story about how as I was coming off the stage, this big, tall guy um, looks like a bouncer just comes marching straight towards me. And I, my, my brain genuinely went, I'm about to get chucked out of this event in front of thousands of people. And he walks up to me and he walks straight past security towards me. And I'm not even down the steps fully yet off the stage. And I'm like kind of looking at this guy like, who's this? And he walks up to me and said, I really like that. He said, we've not met before, but we should do business together. Give me a call. And he slaps my hand, like shakes my hand. He's got a business card in his hand and then he leaves. So I was like, that was weird. So I went and sit down in the the speaker section, which is kind of like in the middle of a stage at the front. And I'm sat next to these other guys and they're kind of looking at me all kind of saying, look at the card, look at the card. I looked at the card. It was the senior vice president for Microsoft Asia. And he was the guy who was sent by Bill Gates to head up their HoloLens project uh, for VR and AR. And he was like, we should do work together. And I'm like, wow. But actually that ended up causing loads more work for us because everyone was like, what did Danny say to you? We should do some work together too. And it was almost because they'd seen him want to do work with us. They now wanted to do work with us too. Mm. Um, So that was probably the proudest day of my life and then as as i was um as in within business and then the very next day we're on our way from shanghai to beijing which is a story we could make an entire podcast just on that story (laughs) because it was um there was a typhoon so we couldn't fly so we had to get the train and all the trains were sold out so somebody smuggled my colleague and i onto a train and we nearly got kicked out by chinese police honest to god you've never seen anything like this story it could be an entire episode of its own program it was nuts (laughs) um but anyway as i get to the airport in 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 beijing um one of the guys back in the uk that i was working with rings me he goes tell me you've seen it i was like seen what and he's like you've not seen it have you I was like, see what? Have we got like another deal come through? He's like, even better. He's like, let me send you this link. 
Campaign Asia, who are like one of the biggest tech magazines in Asia, had just released their write up on the three day event that had been the conference that I've been speaking at. And it was my picture that was front page. And it says Phil Paluccia from the UK sums it up best when he says virtual reality is to give customers immersed in an experience that leaves them wanting more. And then it kind of talks about my talk. And then it, the next bit is, and then Apple told us about this. And I'm like, I beat Apple. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. But it was, it was like, um, but that again, that led to months of business because people were like, Oh, we saw you in campaign Asia. We know we want to have a conversation with you. And, you know, I hadn't even landed and we had a voicemail from um, Korean tech TV saying, we'd like to bring you on our news channel to talk about what you've done at the event and stuff and it was like it was a real game changer for everything that we did um and i'm sure we'll get onto this later but i met the event organizer i got that invite from a podcast wow yeah so yeah, yeah. that was probably the proudest day of, of my life in business mm. oh, i mean i've just yeah i was making little notes of questions as you were speaking there because there's so many things i want to ask so many follow-up questions yeah but- I'll save them for a bit later because I'll be okay. here. <laughs> yeah, otherwise I'll be here all day. Um, okay, so following on from that then, I'd love mm-hmm. to know, like on the other side of the coin, what has been like one of the worst days in your kind of business career? There's one that comes to mind straight away, so I'll tell you about that one. Um, I was working on this project and... Uh, you know we all make mistakes in business and we all kind of learn things as we go along I mean this is actually the reason why we now charge up front for all of the work that we do but I'd ended up doing work for this company for about four or five months and they owed me a 60 grand invoice Um, now now it's like that's that would be painful but right then it it crippled me Um, and it was a, it was like the checks in the mail, the checks in the mail, it's with the accountant. I'll chase it. I'll see where it is and do all this kind of stuff. And then um, I remember it clearly the 21st of December, I got a phone call from somebody who works in that office to say, do you know where the owner is? And I was like, well, why would I know where the owner is? And he said, we've all arrived for work and the doors are locked and everybody's gone. There's no one here. Like we can't get into work. And then it slowly started to dawn on us that the owner had ran off with all the money um and had stolen not just our money and investment but he had no and other people's investment but he had no intention of paying the invoices and he had no intention of paying lots of people's salaries so we all found out the week before christmas that we're not getting paid um and i had basically not done anything for christmas whatsoever because i'd been waiting for this invoice that was supposed to clear in the end of october and here i was with this young family um and literally no money. And when I say no money, I mean, I was probably down to a couple of hundred pounds in my account because I'd been running on very thin ice waiting for this 60 grand invoice to land. And uh, I owed people money. I was in debt because I hadn't paid my suppliers for stuff because, again, I was waiting for the invoice to clear. And I basically spent three days prior to Christmas ringing around my suppliers and the people I owed money to to say, like, look, I'm... I'm sorry, but this is the situation. We'll figure it out together. We'll talk about it after Christmas, but I'm not doing it. So the the issue then became that as much as I was in pain that somebody had now done that to me, I was now forced to do that to other people. So there were other businesses that were now like, Phil, I've got a family too. Like, this is my Christmas money as well. And I'm like, I can't give you what I don't have. Like, what, what do you want me to say? Like, the guys just ran off with the money. Um. And I remember getting a credit card and because I hadn't earned any money for a few months, they would only give me like, I think it was like 1,250 pound limit. And we were able to kind of get some presents in for the kids and we were able to get like Christmas shopping. in, so we kind of had the turkey and the food and all that kind of stuff. And we were, I was able to pay like the gas and electric bill so that we didn't kind of lose heating and light during that period. And my wife and I didn't, didn't have anything for each other. And I've never, I've never felt like such a bum. In, in my whole life mm. like that I wanted to obviously put on a brave face for my kids and go through Christmas but that was that was, wasn't just the most painful Christmas experience of my life that was the most painful experience of my life bar none mm. like if I could have just skipped a week two weeks three weeks past that point I would have done because every minute of it was excruciatingly painful mm. gosh yeah I mean well, thanks for sharing that because, yeah, I'm kind of reliving that when you were describing it. Yeah, it was horrible. <laughs> like it was horrible. Feeling your pain there. And, 
yeah yeah i mean it was awful um and 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 i'm quite an empathetic guy as well so I wasn't just feeling bad for me. I was feeling bad for the people that I had let down. And I was also feeling bad for the people who worked for that team that I got to know quite well over the sort of previous months that now also didn't have a salary before Christmas. Because many of these were like, you know, I don't mean it's in a derogatory way, but there were kids doing telesales jobs. You know, yeah. they weren't making mental money anyway. Like they were mm-hmm. probably going to walk away with a grand, 1500 quid in their paycheck at the end of that month. And that would have been the money that they'd have sorted out Christmas presents for their families and stuff with. And, you know, the, for some scumbag just to kind of knowingly do that. And actually, the more research we did on him as well, the more we found out that this is like the fourth time he'd done this to different companies. Wow. And, um, uh, that taught me three major things. Number one is it taught me do your due diligence, right? Um, that was the biggest one I learned. The second one I learned is nobody gets a single thing from me unless you've paid up front. If there's no money in my bank, I'm not doing any work was the rule that I implemented. And I stick to that to this day. It's not always 100% up front, but you are paying me money before I do any work. Yeah. And that might sound awful. I might be kind of judging people by that standard, but I'm, I'll, I will never go back to making that mistake again, ever. Um, and I guess the other thing that it really taught me was not to have all your eggs in one basket because I'd spent like four or five months just focused on this one company and this one project Mm -hmm. and really kind of giving it my all. And then it went pop. And if I'd have had just even like one or two more clients that I was working at the same time, it wouldn't have been anywhere near as painful. It wouldn't have been great. I'd have still been annoyed that I'd lost 60 grand, but it was that was excruciatingly painful and mm-hmm. I, and, I, and I, a lot of that was self reflective because i remember thinking okay he made that decision not to pay people but i made the decision to put us in this situation mm. oh yeah that's yeah it's powerful that because yeah it's i think it's really painful to take responsibility for something like that but then you know if you do take responsibility you can kind of ensure that it never happens again so that's it if, if i just blamed him exclusively like he's a scumbag right but he'll get his right i believe in karma so he'll get his at some point i'm not worried about him yeah um and and if i in fact if i was him i'd be very very worried about karma because when it catches up with him it's going to be very painful yeah um, <laughs> but you're right like i i would i could have potentially made that same mistake again if i didn't look at the things that i had my responsibilities within that process and learn lessons from them. if i didn't learn the lessons then there's absolutely nothing to stop it from happening again mm. oh, so true um <laughs> And this this question, um, I kind of try and tailor to the kind of the expertise of the guests, and um, mm-hmm. because you know you're very much focused on growth strategies, um, yeah. and I know there's a few specific things you do within that. But I thought it would be good to ask, what's a what's a kind of top growth strategy for 2021 in your opinion that a business should be thinking about? strategic alliances okay 100 percent strategic alliances so um i mentioned earlier so to kind of give people a bit of an idea because I, I practice what i preach you know we seven figure business at the moment we will absolutely smash i mean definitely within 18 months hopefully within 12 we'll smash that eight figure mark um and we don't spend a, a dollar not a cent on paid advertising none okay. um it's it's all strategic partnerships affiliate marketing and content outreach every last bit of it um and i'm a big believer in business is a team sport right so you can be really good at your bit but if you don't surround yourself with people who are equally as good at their part you're not going to win a trophy Mm. and you know i think there's still a um i kind of call it like an industrial revolution mindset of like don't tell your competitors anything (laughs) and actually it's like you're all keeping the same secrets from each other. So for a start, no one's hiding anything, right? <laughs> for another thing, it's like collaboration is so much more effective than than competition. And, and the reason collaboration is so much more effective is that there will be people in your audience that want what you do but don't resonate with you that might resonate more with your competitor. But actually, they also have people in their audience that need what they do but won't buy from them either, and they're waiting to meet you. Yeah. So 
doing stuff together really kind of helps in that perspective, but it also gets, it, it shows a unified front when you kind of go out to your industry, right? So if you can say, look, I'm really good at this bit, but I can introduce you to someone who does this and this bit and this bit, and we typically work together as a collective, what that says to the customer is a few things. Number one, you're not just there to take money for your bit. You're actually mm-hmm. providing a, an entire strategy that can help them and make recommendations. But it also says, well, I, this person can obviously be trusted because other professionals of a high standard within this industry trust and partner with this person and collaborate with this person. So therefore, it's kind of like borrowed credibility, isn't it? You can say you're really good until you're blue in the face. Mm-hmm. Someone else saying it is always 10 times more powerful. Um, and then the final part of that is that it gives you so many more options to be able to actually engage with a potential customer because you can say to them, well, look, um, you know, you, I saw you asking about um, a website, for example. I know a great guy that can do this, this and this. I typically do a lot of work with him. And they're like, well, what, what, what work to do with him? It's like, well, I'm the strategic guy, right? So once you've got a website, you need to drive traffic towards it and you need to increase sales. That's where I come in. And they're like, oh, actually, we're going to need both of you guys. Um, I hadn't even thought about that bit. I was just thinking about the website. I didn't think about I'm going to have to drive traffic to it afterwards. That's a really good point, right? I said, like, well, actually, I know an e-commerce guy that can help you automate that whole process as well. And it's like, oh, bring him too. <laughs> right, so before you know it, you've provided that full sort of suite of solutions to somebody. And you have become, you've gone from being a supplier to that customer to a partner to that customer. Mm -hmm. You're somebody who's going in and actually saying, I can help you. You can call me up with anything that isn't necessarily to do with my bit. And if I don't know someone, I'm very least going to know somebody who knows somebody. Yeah, absolutely. I I love that. I love that answer because um, it's just, yeah, it's, it's so true to how I like to do business. Um, and I actually, I have a, I have a Facebook group that's all about collaboration. Love um, it. And it's funny. I find that for me, it seems quite simple. Like, you know, if you want to get in front of that person's audience over there, message that person and say, yeah. let's do something together. Um, but there's so many people that actually don't know how to yeah. do it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, and, and, you know, yeah, I love it as well, because I think nowadays it's becoming a bit of a myth that in order to be a successful business owner, you have to be a, an influencer, like as a, yeah. as a person um, on Instagram or, or Twitter or even LinkedIn, um, yep. in order to do seven figures or eight figures, you have to have, you know, at least a hundred thousand followers. Like surely yeah, that's, <laughs> surely that's like the number. Um mm. And actually, I always tell people, like, when I, like, tally up the guests I've had on this podcast in particular, like, I'm kind of at 30 guests now. Yeah. Like, over half barely do anything on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, they, they, they're they not, you know, they're not content influencers by any means. I don't like Instagram. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and it's not, it's not my thing and my customers aren't on there either. So yeah, exactly. Um, it's like Facebook. It's like, Oh, everyone's going to be doing Facebook ads. And it's like, none of my customers are on Facebook. They don't have time for this stuff. Like why, yeah. why would I target them on Facebook? And even if they were, it's to go and like pictures of their friends and family's kids and talk about the holidays and stuff. It's, it's not to do work. That's not where mm-hmm. they want to do business. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know you've got to meet people where they're at and you've got to kind of appreciate that people people are entitled to their downtime just as much as they're entitled to their work time and by mixing the two actually all you end up doing is annoying people i mean (laughs) i saw a post recently and somebody said just a heads up if you interrupt my youtube video or my music playlist with your advert i will hate your brand forever and i just <laughs> thought actually that's a really good point so you think you're doing great by putting it out there and actually you're just irritating people mm. you know they on youtube they come in up I, I did the, the premium thing now so i don't have to watch the adverts but on youtube it's like i'm just waiting for that five seconds to pass so that i can click skip ad i'm not paying any attention to you whatsoever and mm. in fact regularly i'm getting sick of seeing your face that is not <laughs> something you want to achieve as a business that's i'm pretty sure your objective was not i'm going to annoy my ideal prospects yeah um yeah. but using the analogy that you use like I, I hear people all the time say you know if i could kind of get a list of my my uh, my competitors customers i'd retarget them on like facebook ads and stuff 
And he's like, how, how can we get hold of that list? And I was like, do a joint event with them and speak to each other's audiences. I mean, surely this is pretty simple. Yeah. Like, invite them on a podcast, <laughs> you know? They're going to share it with their audience. You're going to share it with yours. Now you've spoken to both audiences. Yeah. Like, it doesn't have to be as cloak and dagger as you think it is. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually pretty simplistic, isn't it? It's like, <laughs> you want to do more work with someone, talk to them and do more work with them. Yeah. It's like, it's not rocket science so true so true so thank you thank you for sharing that because that's <laughs> that's like no, you're welcome. What i'm plugging on a daily basis um okay and this is kind of the the final question in the not so rapid rapid fire round <laughs> mm-hmm. um so i mean i spoke to you uh, about this when we first spoke um mm-hmm. about my ethos which is something called success without sacrifice yeah and um and you kind of shared with me a little bit about how that resonated with you so I just love it if you could kind of repeat yourself and share it with now everybody listening like what that means to you what does success without sacrifice mean to you as a successful business owner okay so there's a few few things to touch on with this then I guess so success without sacrifice for me is it's getting the balance right, right? We're all being taught that this hustle, hustle, hustle mentality is the only way to be successful. And it's it's so not true. Um, and in fact, you know, rest and recuperation is such an important part of success. And, and people kind of overlook it and they'll say, well, I'll rest when I get to this point. And I think that's really sad because people burn out and there's that kind of point of diminished returns as well where you're pushing too hard and actually start to get less from yourself than than you would so i mentioned earlier i work four day weeks i'm never going to go back i love working four day weeks it's brilliant um i also know that i'm the type of person that i don't sleep very well when i have an alarm set Mm. so because of that i don't do any meetings before 11 a.m because i wake up naturally i never have an alarm set if i wake up at 6 or 7 a.m great if i wake up at half 10 in the morning it's a quick breakfast um you know but i will let my body do what i need to do and i don't feel like it's almost people take the attitude of you have to sacrifice your body your time your well-being your mental well-being your stress levels your family your relationships your friendships all to kind of have this success and it couldn't be further from the truth in fact spending time with those people and recharging the batteries is some of the most important things that you could ever do mm. within your business um you know, and, and I, I often tell a story of a, a guy that I knew and, and he had this, he would work six days a week, 17, 18 hours a day. Like he would work really hard. And I remember him saying like the, the aim of this is to get to the point where he can retire by the time he's 45 to 50. So he was going to rest at that point. Cause he was like, I don't want to be like 70 and not able to enjoy myself. I want to be 45, 50 and be able to retire. He died of a massive heart attack in his mid thirties. Mm. So he never got there. Um, and you know, you, you have to take that kind of rest and recuperation stuff seriously. And I think we're talking about the influences, right? But there's so many of these Instagram fake gurus, these fake shakes that are like the way to success is hustle, hustle, hustle. Mm. And you're like, you're a moron because that (laughs) that's not true. And you're just, you're a snake oil salesman. That's all you are. Mm. You're, you're flogging the dream. And it's like, I can show you how to run a really successful marketing agency. And it's like, then how come 90% of your money comes from showing other people how to do it? Smart yeah. ass. Mm. You know, how come you aren't off running a really successful marketing agency? Mm. You know? So I think there's less and less of that now because people are starting to become a lot more kind of a lot more skeptical of it. And yeah. when you see like, here's this client, here's Chris, Chris came to me and he was broke and now he's a billionaire. And you're like, mm, no, he's not. <laughs> Mm. Chris is your mate. He's an intern who works in your office, and you made him wear a suit so that he could do the video. That's <laughs> that's not true. Um, and I think people are starting to see that now. But that that success without sacrifice for me is all about that, right? It's getting the balance right. It is ultimately it's balance. And and the ironic thing is, I don't believe that you can have success with sacrifice. I don't think because is that even success? I mean, what are you what are you deeming to be successful? Like I want to make five million dollars, right? Well you've now made five million dollars, but you've got no friends anymore. Your kids don't speak to you and you're divorced. Are you successful? Mm. No. You know, you're of course you're not successful. You're just a rich loner. Right. Now you're and, and now what are you gonna do? You're gonna attract some somebody who wants to be a bit of a gold digger and you're gonna have a loveless relationship and 
you know, people all only expect money from you because that's all you've got to give. I mean, that's that's a sad world that we live in. If the only thing that you can share with people is money, if the only people around you want money from you and not your time and not your love and not your laughter and not your joy, then you're surrounding yourself with the wrong people. Mm. Oh, I just love that so much. Um, and because last time we spoke, you you kind of said, well, you were telling me about like your journey and. Um, I mean, you didn't say it word for word like this, but basically the essence of what you told me was that um, when you were kind of earning your first million dollars, um, it almost killed you. You did, yeah. But yeah. now, yeah. I mean, I, I, oh, sorry, go on. Well, we don't even know when we're making it now. Like, I, I don't even look like genuinely. We're, we're now at the point that I don't look at the bank account because there's no need. I know there's always cash in there, so I don't need to worry about it. I mean, if I'm doing something like buying a house, then I might try and figure out what's in there or something, but you know, everything was always built around money. It was always, it was always money, money, money. And I nearly killed myself like genuinely. And I don't mean like suicide. I mean, like I almost put myself in a grave. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I remember, um, I caused my appendix to rupture through stress. So I was on high blood pressure medication. I was overweight. I was really unhappy. I was working silly hours and not really sleeping. Um, I was working with clients on both sides of the world to try and mitigate the risk and earn more money. But that meant that there was literally three hours for sleep, maybe four if I was lucky of a night kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I would do that seven days a week. Um, you know, my kids hardly ever saw me. I, and I don't mind sharing this. I had a, a really bad problem with cannabis. So I was probably self-medicating with about hundred to 150 pounds worth of cannabis a day. Like I was high my whole life. Like I was just, because it was the only way that I could cope with the stress. And I would find that the cannabis would help me to be sort of quite micro focused on what I was doing. And if I didn't smoke, it would all kind of get on top of me that I had so many plates spinning at the same time mm. and it freaked me out. But anyway, my appendix ruptured and I got taken into surgery, literally emergency surgery. They wanted to keep me in hospital for three days afterwards, 12 hours after the operation, I discharged myself and went to a business meeting. Um, because and I still I literally still had like the the hospital wrapping over my scars because they hadn't even done the proper chance to have a proper clean out yet and put new um uh, new stitches on and all that kind of stuff because I just cleared off I was gone I was like listen I'm done I'm like no 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 we we strongly advise against this like three days you know max me a minimum forty eight hours and I'm like no no I'm, I've got to go mm. and, and and I actually left because I was trying to work from my hospital bed. And the nurses kept shouting at me for having my phone on in the ward. So I left. Mm. Um, so I was even trying to work before that. And, you know, I remember at the time I actually spoke to some people about it. And this, this kind of tells you the difference in mentality, right? I spoke to some people about it and they were like, oh, mate, what a hustler. What a grinder. Love it. Love the attitude. Then I spoke to my loved ones around me and they were genuinely upset. They were like, you, you are not taking care of yourself. You've got small children that you've got to be around for for the next 20, 30, 40 years. And you're, you're burning the candle at both ends, son. You're not going to be around very much longer to do this. And, um, and anyway, we got to the, the kind of the, the million dollars point. And I, by this point, I was smoking about 150 pounds worth of cannabis a day i was probably going through about two to three sheets of reni tablets you know the anti-acid tablets per day um just to try and keep my peptic ulcers under control because i had horrific ulcers um i was in a i was in a right mess a real real mess and I just had built this completely the wrong way. And I was making that mistake that a lot of entrepreneurs make actually. And there'll be people listening to this that are making this mistake right now. So if you are, please heed this warning, right? You can't be all things to all people. You can't wear every hat in your business. It's not possible. And so many people say things like, well, I know that, but I can't afford to hire someone right now. So I'll just do this until I can afford to hire someone. Well, do a trade mm. for the sake of your health and the sake of your family. Do a trade. I mean, I did a trade for our website, our CRM system, our early marketing campaigns, our copyright. I did a trade for almost everything that you can imagine to get your business started. People saying, I've got this great business idea. I just need 10 grand capital to be able to get to where I need to be. And when you break it down, they don't need that at all. They need physical things. They need items. They need yeah. services. 
and you can do a trade for those services. You know, go and find the people that you resonate with. I say your vibe attracts your tribe, right? Go and find the people that you resonate with and do a trade with those people. Listen, mate, I'm really good at my bit. You're really good at your bit. Why don't we do a bit of a swap? Because actually that's worth more to us both than the monetary value that we would exchange for the goods. Yeah. And that was a real game changer for me because then I started getting really cheeky with it. Like, I wonder what else I can trade for. <laughs> um, and it just became like like loads of fun. Like, I would trade for crazy stuff. Like, we would get, you know, even things outside of work. We'd get, like, flight upgrades. We'd get hotels. We'd get restaurant reservations months earlier than we should. We'd get, you know, all of this stuff just by trading. Mm. Um. And when you start to build that network up as well, right? You want because one of the things that we do with our network, for example, is we'll do like a ten percent referral fee. So I'll get ten percent of anything I send to anybody else. They'll get ten percent of stuff that I refer to them, etc. And and we just refer business to each other and need to get ten percent. So what I would do is I would trade and I say, look, I've got this great person who does this, this, and this. And if you've come via me, you can get a 10% discount. And they'd be like, oh, mate, brilliant. Let's do a swap for that. So they trade me in exchange for me not taking the 10% commission from that person <laughs> just by making the introduction. So everybody would get what they want. Yeah. Um, but you don't have to wear every hat. And every, like so many entrepreneurs make that mistake. And it's, it is painful to watch because you see them trying to spin all of these plates. And the reality is, you know, going back to that sports analogy, you know, if you're going to be the player who stands in the box to score the goals, you're not also going to be the midfielder crossing it into you to score the goal. Because if you're the dude crossing it, who's in the box to score it? Yeah. And why do you think... Um, why do you think people don't think of doing that why do you think they just automatically rule it out that they can you know have a website built or have professional photos done or or yeah have somebody run a marketing campaign like why mm. do people not think about this for themselves what? Honest answer, I think it's because of our education system, right? Our education system taught us that you need to be good consistently across the board in the subjects that you like and the subjects that you don't like. Mm -hmm. Like if you were good at two particular subjects in school, let's say they were the, the extrovert subjects. So you were really good at drama and really good at music and you would get A in both of those classes, but D's and E's in all the others, your parents would be called into school to talk about how you're failing, how mm -hmm. you need to improve, how you need to do all this kind of stuff. So the whole education education system is designed to teach you that you have to be a generalist you mm -hmm. have to be able to do all of these things equally as well and actually that's just simply not true it's not true mm -hmm. um you know in business that's not how this works i am really good at my bit right but as far as the rest of my business school report it is concerned i'm failing at all the other areas <laughs> so i outsource them right i'll go to someone else and say dude you are really good at double science i suck at science you go and do science for me and i'm gonna go and do drama for you because you hate drama right and we're gonna get an a on our school report combined mm. right and if you do that that virtual business school report ends up with straight a's all across the board because you've got the right people in the right places but but our education system doesn't teach us that so from the age of what four or five depending on when your birthday is to the age of you know earliest uh, 18 that's how you've been taught that's how you become successful so these people are successful and these people are failing mm. but actually the people who are failing and smashing one particular, one or two particular areas and failing the rest, they would make brilliant entrepreneurs. Mm, oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, so I want to ask you about obviously podcasting because you, yep. you attribute a lot of your success to it, and you Certainly do. You teach people now how to do it, and mm -hmm. um, I read as well that you're ranked as the top one hundred or top in the top one hundred podcasters in the world, which is mental yeah. think about it's like, cool, isn't it? <laughs> so many so got, in this world yeah so two two podcast titles in the mo at the moment which i'm really proud of so number one is we're ranked as a top 100 podcast well i am ranked as a top 100 podcaster uh, and as a business we are the number one ranked in the world for podcast publicity for businesses wow. um so yeah very proud of those things so okay well brilliant because then you're the perfect person to ask this question <laughs> which is what makes a good podcast authenticity mm. it's got to be authentic right because people 
the reason that people are drawn to podcasts is that it, it's not television and it's not radio it's not overly polished it's not it's not fine-tuned i mean having now done work in television you know i'll tell you that they'll record two hours worth of content to put out a 43 minute show Mm -hmm. and i don't even always necessarily agree with the bits that the producers took out (laughs) right um whereas a podcast is raw and it's authentic and it's it's and it's real and people people feel like they know you having listened to a number of your podcast episodes either as a guest or as a host um which means that you're so much further down that buying process as well because it's not a fresh relationship it's like oh i already know this dude i'm gonna call him and every conversation i have with people starts and they're talking to me like them and their friend already because as far as they're concerned they've had five six hours minimums worth of conversations with me Mm. um so they feel like they know me already and you know i had one a client the other day actually did it and he real real life working example in fact was yesterday actually i think one of my clients brought on his marketing director onto the call onto a strategy call and he said um i now see the power of podcasting and he said and i did it without even noticing and I said, okay. He went, the CEO told me that we were working with you. So I went and started listening to some of your podcasts. And my intention was, I'm going to listen to one of his podcasts on the way home. I said, okay. He said, I now listen to you every single morning and every night on my drive to and from work. And I'm learning so much that I'm telling my friends, my family, and my colleagues in the office, oh, I'm listening to this podcast. I learned this. Who is it? Oh, you definitely got to check him out. Billionaires in boxes. It's brilliant. Go do this. It's this guy. Go check out this. Recommending episodes. And he said, so in the last week alone, he said, I know it's small fry for you. He said, but in the last week alone, I've probably recommended 25 to 30 new subscribers to your podcast just off the back of me listening to what you do. Mm. And he said, so I'm, I'm sold before we've even gotten the phone call. He said, in fact, I'm genuinely excited to get on the phone with you because I feel like I already know. In fact, can I just say thank you for all the advice? He said, because actually you've already helped me in my business. Mm. And when he left the call, the CEO said to me, he's quite a calm kind of guy like a very mellow guy said in fact i don't remember the last time i saw him that excited talking to somebody (laughs) he said so that's high praise indeed right but that's the power of podcasting right so it's it's about that authenticity and it's about if you're learning and growing from it so are other people because if you if you are if you have a burning question that you want to ask somebody and go down that rabbit hole and say right look i've got tons of questions for you here but i can't just brush past that answer i need to deep dive deeper into that and kind of explore that with you you can guarantee that your audience will also be going whoa don't go past that bit ask him this like go deeper into that bit Mm. and that's that's the joy of podcasting um so to to have a successful podcast it's all about authenticity um and this is gonna sound like a really odd thing to say as a second piece of advice but you know sorry audience that are listening i do like you really but it's not about the audience the power of podcasting is not in the audience the power of podcasting is in the networking Mm -hmm. because the person who won't give you 10 to 15 minutes on the phone to talk about your business will give you 60 minutes on a podcast to build a relationship um use this again we're in we're doing this podcast now right but if you contacted my team and said i want to have an hour-long strategy session with phil they'd send you an invoice yeah you know what i mean they'd send you a payment link and say great pay that and then we'll get you booked in Mm. but when you're trading something other than monetary value, you're trading an exchange of information, you're trading access to an audience, you're trading the ability to reach new people. That's worth more than the financial exchange to me of, well, let's do it one-on-one. Mm. Like if you want to do one-on-one, you pay for one-on-one. If we're going to do one to many that you've already kind of paid that. Um, and that's more like kind of paying it forward, isn't it? Absolutely. So, the reason that 90% of podcasts and podcast guests will never make any money from podcasting. And that's an official stat, by the way, in fact, it's more than that. But the the reason that 90% will never do it is because they try and run it like a TV or radio show. And they do the whole thing about the audience. Mm. And it's like, I'm everybody I'm bringing on is to get more listeners, more audience. I need more audience so I can sell sponsorship and advertising. And that's it. I mean, if you genuinely think that sponsorship and advertising is the only way to make money through podcasting, you need to take the blinkers off and take a much closer look at this opportunity because the power is in the networking. Mm, oh, so interesting. Oh uh, yeah. Cause that was going to be my next question is why, why the 90% of people not make, not make any money from podcasting. So that's why, 
Yeah, they try and run it like a TV or radio show. So the whole thing is around, you know, TV and radio make money through advertising and sponsorship, right? But to make money through advertising and sponsorship, you need a wide audience. So you need a large audience. But in reality, like most of us business owners, we don't need a huge audience. I mean, I mean, I'm blessed to have one now, but we don't we don't need that. Um, you know, I, I often use the analogy, the highest paid Hollywood agent doesn't have 500 clients. They have five. Yeah. They also aren't on Instagram flogging themselves going, I've just got Brad Pitt in this movie. It's like they don't need to because yeah. when they fire a client, not the other way around, important distinction, but when they fire a client, there's a line of people around the block ready to work with them because they're the best at what they do and they only work with those five. Mm. That should be the way that most people, especially in coaching and consulting world, design their business if you're a service-based business coaching consultancy you know strategic consultancy that should be the way that you design your business i understand software and products you're going to need to sell much more to a wider audience i get that's just a slightly different methodology for you but the idea that you need a hundred thousand followers on instagram or linkedin to be a successful business coach is absolute nonsense yeah <laughs> that's so true i say that to people all the time like like clients of mine who are service providers who are obsessed like they'll spend the whole day on social media like obsessing about it and the reality is they need yeah five to ten clients to be super successful <laughs> definitely <laughs> you can go out you can go and get those and you know, if you really wanted to get them you could just cold call and probably get them <laughs> like, well actually if they spent that time instead of being on social media if they spent that time engaging with conversations with what i call non-competitive partners so these are people who sell to your ideal audience already but don't do what you do and you all create those strategic alliances together how much more business would you have so let's say you're spending two hours a day on social media and you're probably spending more but let's say you're spending two hours a day on social media that's two really good conversations with partners who already have access to your clients yeah. right and at the end of that conversation if you've resonated together you can say well look tell me about the kind of people that you want introducing to and as i come across them i'll introduce them and invariably what will happen is you'll go oh i actually know some of them let me contact this person let me contact this person what about you here's what i'm looking for and they go oh actually i've got two or three of those already that's three potential new customers off the back of that call and it's coming via referral. And as everybody knows, it's always far easier to re close referred business than it is to, re to close cold business. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. I just want to, I just want to like hammer out this point before we move on. So, mm -hmm. so let's say you have a podcast and mm -hmm. you're in that 90% that aren't monetizing. Mm -hmm. Is it safe to assume then that the problem is that you're not coming across authentic because otherwise, if you were, people would just be reaching out to you, asking to work with you. No, no. So in fact, it's probably more that you're only still. So podcasting is just one third of it, right? Okay. So the other two thirds of the process are how you repurpose that content for your social media. So that's like, you know, casting the nets out to catch the fish yep. but it's also how you use that content for direct outreach so it's making a list of your ideal customers linkedin is usually a great place so making a list of your ideal customers messaging those 20 customers and saying here is a link to a podcast interview i did with such and such a person thought you might enjoy it if it resonates i'd love to jump on the phone and learn more about what you do as a business mm. i call that fishing with bait right if you go out and do that for 20 people five of them will ignore you five of them will say thanks but no thanks 10 of them will come back and say i'm actually interested in the conversation mm -hmm. how many of those 10 can you convert into business how many of those 10 do you need to convert into business if you're doing that once twice a week every time you you publish an episode mm -hmm. okay well, that's uh, that's super useful thank you for that thank you for literally spelling it out because <laughs> no you're welcome <laughs> that's really helpful um one thing actually I also wanted to ask you, and this came again off our previous conversation, um, was that you talked about how um, you you used to play football for Manchester mm. City when you were younger, but you're mm -hmm. obviously a avid Liverpool supporter. Massive Liverpool fan, yeah. And you used to wear your Liverpool shirt. I, I did, yeah. <laughs> your Man City shirt when you played. Why? Why is it? Why was it important for you to to do that? It's a good question. I mean, I, probably, I think there's probably two two answers to that. So the first one is like when I used to 
sort of play in my back garden and be kicking the ball against the shed wall and pretending to score the winner in the FA Cup final and score the winning goal that wins you the league. It was always for Liverpool, right? Mm. So that was the dream. That was how you got the best out of me, was me wanting to do it for Liverpool. So by wearing it under my shirt, I constantly kept that connection to Liverpool and so that, that connection to that dream. So that's the first one. The second one is probably just so I didn't feel like a sellout, if I'm completely honest, because um, <laughs> I wanted to be at Liverpool. That was where I wanted to be, but they didn't want me. <laughs> um, so it was my way of kind of, you know, if I couldn't get tickets for a Liverpool game, I wouldn't go and watch City instead. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's, that's not kind of how being a football supporter works. Like you love your club through thick and thin and, and, and that's just kind of the way it is. Or if your team has a bad season, you don't go, right, well, I'm going to go and support United for the year then. Cause they're doing pretty well. Like, I mean, there's some people like that, but I've got no time for people like that. So even from a playing perspective, there was an element of, you know, I don't, I want to be at Liverpool. Like I'm grateful I'm here, but actually, like if Liverpool rang me tomorrow and was like, Phil, we've made a mistake. We want you to come over to the academy. Like I'd have been there in a shot, mm -hmm. you know, I'd have been on the phone to city at Melwood going, I'm not coming back. You know what I mean? Like that, that would have been the way it was. And that's not because I'm ungrateful for the opportunity that they gave me. It's because that was my dream. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it was more important that it kind of kept me going. And actually here, here's a, Here's an honest one for you. I mean, I'm doing it right now. I'm wearing Liverpool football trainers right now. I'm wearing Liverpool branded trainers. Like there is always, I'm always wearing something that reminds me of Liverpool. When I do a lot of keynote speeches and I have to wear a suit and tie, which is, I never wear a suit and tie. But when I have to wear a suit and tie to go to these events, I wear my Kenny Dalglish tie. And Kenny Dalglish, years ago, this is many years ago, he gave me his player's tie. And on the on the wrapping on the that it came in, he signed his, his signature. So I still have that in a frame. And the only time that that tie ever comes out of that, that sleeve is when I'm going to go and wear it for a keynote speech. And that's because that's still my connection to Liverpool and that dream. That's still that winning connection for me, mm. even though I'm doing something that's nothing to do with business. I still take that motivation from it. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's really interesting because um, cause your family is also obviously a big motivator for you. And you actually said this great quote to me um, when we spoke, um, which you basically said, you work, you work for your family, but your family comes first. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I know we're kind of recircling a little bit back to what we were originally talking about, but there's something there about like not losing that connection with what you truly love or like what yep. truly matters. Like how does that, and you've also talked about like the fact that you are, your natural tendency is to be a bit of a workaholic and yeah, yeah. work hard and put the time in. Do you think, do you think it's all kind of, do you think it's all kind of linked together in that you're oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. It definitely is. I mean, it's it's a. Uh, I have that winning mentality, and and when you have that winning mentality, the reason that you I mean we're going back to sport now, but the reason that you need good coaches around you is because young players have a tendency to burn out because they don't know when to stop, they don't know when to rest, and they push, push, push. So for me, I you know as I got older, that I kind of had to do that for myself. So there are things that are set in my calendar in stone that don't get moved. There will be nothing that goes around them. So breakfast, lunch, and dinner with my family every single day, the days off and every single Liverpool game. And in fact, mostly because I'm Liverpool affect my mood so much. Like when we win, I'm on cloud nine. When we lose, I'm raging. Like I'm, I'm in <laughs> such a bad mood um, that no meetings can happen after a Liverpool game. It's just, it's not possible. I can't take the game off and then go back to work. It's just, mm. I'm either giddy and not paying attention because Liverpool have just won or I'm raging and don't want to talk to anybody. Okay. So, they are the times that there, there is no movement around that. Those are, those are solidified in my calendar and that's it. And, and it, I kind of liken it to, um, I used to train and uh, I didn't have a very good relationship at home. So what would happen is I do my training session and then I'd stick around and do training sessions with the other age groups because I didn't want to go home. And the amount of times that I'd hear my coach, like just from the car park, Philip, 
go home. It was like, and it was just because I was, it was like, stop playing because they could see what I was going to do. I was going to burn out. And to be fair, I ended up being medically retired in my early twenties with a, with a knackered shin bone. So that is exactly what happened. Um, so, and that was a very painful experience, both physically and emotionally, because mm-hmm. my dream was now gone. I was never, you know, there was always an element of Liverpool one day might still happen. When, you, when you're when you still a professional player, there's still a chance that at some point they might see me and say, come home. Mm-hmm. And getting medically retired, that was it then. That that dream was now gone. I was never, ever going to play for Liverpool. That was never going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember kind of, the overwhelming feeling wasn't pity or even like feeling sorry for myself. It was, well, now what? <laughs> Cause I have absolutely like, everything that I've ever done. has been aimed at that. And now I don't know what to do. Mm. Um, so when I came into business and I kind of had the ability to start setting up, I started out with really good intentions and those intentions were like, I will have set times to do this, this, and this. And then you start to trade with yourself. You're like, well, I haven't really achieved what I said I was going to do. I know I said I was going to stop at eight, but uh, I really want to get this done. So, and then you do it before you know it, it's half one in the morning and everyone's already gone to bed and you're still working. Mm. But before you know it, you've done that five days on the bounce. Right. And then you start to realize that it's too late. Now you've already made that, that sacrifice. You've already made that trade which is why I think, you know, it comes with, I mean, I made myself sick to get here, but it it does come with a a real sense of, you know, mental strongness, I guess, and mental stability to be able to say, no, no, these are the immovables in my life. Uh, And again, it was, it all came down to perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Did I just want to have loads of money and no family or were my family more important to me than money? Mm -hmm. And it was like, no, no, my family are far more important to me than money. But, I want money because I like money and I can give my family a better life if I have money. Mm. Um, So then it came about. So, okay, but my family is still the priority because I'd rather be broke and have them than be rich and alone. So if they're the priority, then they're the immovable, right? So therefore they go into my calendar before anything else. What comes second? Would I do a phone call and a business deal that's making me money during a Liverpool game no (laughs) like because Liverpool for me is a non-negotiable right that that is up there with my family they are my family I love them just as much as my family you know I go to the stadium with with the same set of friends over and over again we we travel all across Europe together we go all around the world together for, for with a shared passion and a shared love of this club so no there is nothing in the world apart from my family that would stop me doing that. But thankfully my family are all massive Liverpool fans who all feel <laughs> exactly the same. Um, so, you know, my wife would be like, no, at no point is my wife going to be like, well, we should go out for dinner. It's Valentine's day. She'd be like, no, no, sod that the game's on. Let's, let's get a takeaway and watch the footy. Right? And, and that's, that's helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, but once I knew that it was like, okay, so family time and football time go in my calendar and they're the immovables mm-hmm. end of story and work fits around them. Yeah. not the other way around okay interesting um uh, i've just learned so much from this conversation and yeah i know i know the listeners will have as well um so yeah first of all thanks thanks so much for your time and for being so transparent and like actually answering my questions and <laughs> like honesty sharing. is the best policy right well, yeah. people, if people are really going to learn then they need to see like they need to see the rough with the smooth. There are some great times and there are some pretty awful times and you will learn more from the awful times than you will from the great times. Yeah. And, um, but you have, you have to go through this, right? Because you have to have the, so I now know that if this all went belly up tomorrow, I could rebuild and I could be successful because I know the formula to do that. Yeah. But if you've just struck it lucky and you've never had those hard times to kind of build a solid foundation from and learn these lessons, if it goes pop tomorrow, you're in trouble because you are going to have to hope that you get lucky again and riding your luck is a dangerous thing in business oh absolutely and i've learned that lesson the hard way so (laughs) you you explained that beautifully um okay final question then Mm. Uh, and again this is something i ask all all my guests um so obviously the the name of the podcast is millionaire secrets and i am really trying to 
I am really trying to learn from those who are, you know, in the top 1% because that's, that's what it is these days is if you're doing seven figures, you're, you're certainly in the top 1%. So mm-hmm. what, obviously you've shared so much today and I'm sure maybe there's a summary in there somewhere, but um, in your opinion, Phil, mm-hmm. what, um, what is, what is, a, what is your millionaire secret? I want two. I don't want one. Can I give you two? Yeah, go for it. So one of them I've already touched on. I don't think the other one I have. So the one I've already touched on is that business is a team sport, yeah. right? So you've got your, you, to win a trophy, to win a competition, being a good player at what you do isn't enough. You have to surround yourself with people who are just as good at what, what you do. And you, what you'll start to find as you climb that ladder is, you know, we, I'm blessed that I have a number of billionaire mentors now. And what I find is they all do business together all the time. Like 20, 30 years down the line, it's still the same group of people doing the same deals every time something comes up because they hunt in packs. They work together and they like who they work with and they trust who they work with. So if yeah. you don't don't have that team of people around you. And when I say team, I'm not talking about your employees. I'm talking about other businesses. If you don't have those business relationships, if you're sat thinking, I don't even have one of those, right? How are you going to win a football match? You need 11 players on the pitch and a handful of them on the bench, Mm. right? How are you going to win a footy game or a trophy or a champions league or the premier league or the world cup, whatever's going to resonate best with you. If it's just you, you're going to get battered every single time. Yeah. right but if you start to surround yourself with people who are equally as good at their bit as you are at yours it means that you can now focus on the bit that you're best at knowing that they've got your back and they've got those bits covered mm-hmm. that is definitely a big one and the second you start doing that you will start to see massive massive shifts in the success that you're having in your business and it's a lot of fun because you're now working with people that you vibe with and you can pick up the phone and have celebrate together you know that um uh, I call it the Jerry Maguire money dance. You know, the show me the money dance where he's like, like, you do that. And we've all done it, right? We all do that little dance when we do a big deal. Like if we're stood in the kitchen or we're stood in our office and we're literally dancing because we've had a big deal coming through. It's more fun when there's four or five of you doing that dance together. I promise you. It's like, we're awesome. This is amazing. Isn't this fun? Right. But at the same time, they're there to pick you up when times are hard because they've all been through that too. And again, like, you'll be sat thinking, I've got this massive problem. It's a nightmare. I don't know how I'm going to fix it. And then you chat with some of those people in your team and they go, oh, I had that a couple of years ago. You do this, this, and this. And it's like, you've just saved me like 12 months of heartache. Like, thank you so much. Yeah. And it's like, I can show you how to do it if you want. And it's like, oh, my days, this is brilliant. So there's one, right? The second one is that money is a frequency. Mm. right and a lot of people think about money in like a currency perspective like same with wealth right wealthy people to you are people that have loads of money in the bank but there are lots of other ways of being wealthy there's being spiritually wealthy there's being wealthy with love wealthy with life wealthy with happiness like you know some of the happiest people in the world don't need all the money in the world in fact some very successful people when it comes to finance and they have money in the bank they're miserable and like they are they might be cash rich but they're life poor right and one of the things that I think you'll start to realize is if you just aim for the money in isolation, you end up in that category of cash rich and life poor. Yeah. And honestly, I can tell you that one of the quickest ways to achieve abundance in your life, including cash, is that you work on every one of those aspects together. You don't sacrifice your family and your friends and your your love and your laughter and all that kind of stuff because at one point you'll make enough money that you can now stop and go and enjoy yourself. It doesn't work like that, right? It's like the chicken and the egg kind of thing. It's like, uh, you know, I'm I'm not happy with how I feel physically, But when I've made enough money, I'll hire a personal trainer. Well, no, because that lack of physical health is holding you back from reaching your true potential. Yeah. So do the two things simultaneously and you'll have far more success. So I think for me, I'll set your listeners a challenge, right? And and many of them won't do it. And I'm calling them out as cowards now. (laughs) Others others will do it and it, it will feel strange. But if they stick to it, I guarantee, and that's a strong word, but I guarantee they'll see the impact, right? And that challenge is 
do it for two weeks time. So do it beginning of next month or whenever it is that, that, that this goes out. Right. So do it for, don't have to do it tomorrow, but do it for in a couple of weeks time. Block out the times with your family in your calendar that you want. Block out time for movie night. Block out time to go to the gym. Block out time for family dinners. Block out time for the football. Right, Whatever it is that's important to you, block that time out. And it's non-negotiable. Nobody can touch it. And on top of that, book off one day, two consecutive weeks in a row in the middle of the week. So book off Wednesday for two weeks in a row. And what I want you to do is I want you to see how much better you feel kind of having that time to rest and be here with your family and fully be present. I'm not talking about go and have dinner with your family, but have your cell phone there. So you're still replying to all your emails and stuff like turn it off, go and go and be present in the moment. Like if when you're all in at work, be all in at home, right? Do that and then reassess it after those two weeks and ask yourselves the kind of the following questions. You know, did the world fall apart? Did my business stop because I took those days off? You know, did I realize that there are actually things in my day that I really don't need to be doing? I could delegate to other people so that I could focus on these bits. You know, is my relationship with my family better because I took that time off? Are they wanting me to spend more time with them? And if you start to see these things, you're going to get to see where the strengths are in your life and your business, but also where the inefficiencies are that you need to work on. Mm amazing oh yeah i hope that i'll do the challenge and i'll hope that some people will join me <laughs> on the challenge um and hopefully we can report back to you <laughs> yeah it. do i'd love to i'd love to hear the answers because it will make a massive difference it really yeah. will it will make a huge huge difference and you know you're you're able to give a hundred percent on monday tuesday thursday friday in between the times that you're working but flip it because so many of us and i guarantee that your listeners will be the same are fitting their family and life around work and it should Mm. be the other way around Mm. oh yeah it's yeah such a simple thing but it's so challenging (laughs) to even comprehend but yeah i think that's where yeah well that's where growth comes isn't it (laughs) definitely absolutely (laughs) amazing so where can people come and find you and learn more from you Good question. Thank you. Um, so billionairesinboxes.com is always a good good place to go. There's everything on there. It talks about what we do, what our podcasts are on there. There's links to some of our guest episodes on there as well. So go down the rabbit hole and have some fun. Uh, and if you want to talk to me directly, the only social media account I actually manage myself is my LinkedIn account. <laughs> um, so come and talk to me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can drop me a message. It's Philip Pellucci. I'm sure the link's in the show notes below. So in fact, if you click on the show notes below and you see my LinkedIn page, go and click on it and when you connect with me there's an option to add a note just let me know that you've come from this podcast so i kind of know the things that you've already heard Mm. um whether that's to tell me how you've got on whether that's to tell me you think i'm crazy whatever i'm I'm, I've, i've heard it all i'm good with it right but um yeah connect come say hi wonderful thanks so much um yeah thank you for having me it's been amazing it's like mind has been blown in many ways so (laughs) i uh, (laughs) look forward to seeing the reaction of, of the listeners as well good well thank you for having me it's been a real pleasure to be here thank you so much for listening and please don't keep these millionaire secrets to yourself i actually have a favor to ask you now we're in season two I really want to get this podcast out in front of more people, which means pleasing the podcast algorithms. So starting from now, every week, I'll be selecting one person who leaves a five-star review or who shares this podcast with a friend to have a free business coaching session with me. If you would like to hear more from me or get to know me a bit more, um, you can connect with me on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn at Beth and Jepson, or you can join the Success Circle Network Facebook group, or you could visit bethandjepson.com for a whole bunch of free resources for building a business that not only allows you to scale to seven figures, but that also allows you to scale your business and have time for the things that make you happy and healthy success without sacrifice is my ethos. I am so thrilled to be recording podcasts again. So please get ready for some great episodes this season. And I will see you and speak to you all very soon.